Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to our very special poetry reading and dance performance, celebrating the anthology, Dear Human at the Edge of Time, Poets on Climate Change in the United States. My name's John Smalley. I'm a librarian at the San Francisco Public Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community and to tell you about a few of the programs that are coming up this week. On behalf of the Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush alone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Today's program is part of this month's Everybody's Climate Program series. We hope that these programs will inspire you to take action for a greener, safer, and more sustainable future. One of these programs, uh, this Tuesday on Zoom, uh, we hope you'll join us for an online poetry reading featuring indigenous poets from Oceana and Turtle Island who will be sharing poetry and stories that honor ancestral connections to land and water. Wednesday, the next day, at 5 p.m. in this room, we're presenting the award-winning documentary, The Reluctant Radical, with a post-screening Q&A with the film's star, Ken Ward, the environmental activist. And on Thursday at noon in the Corette Auditorium across the way, we're screening a documentary, Elemental, a Reimagining Wildfire, narrated by Dr. I'm sorry, by actor David Oyelowo. Elemental takes viewers on a journey with the nation's experts to understand fire. And this screening will be followed by a panel discussion on how San Francisco is responding to increasing frequency of fire and extreme weather events. Also on Thursday in this room at 6 p.m., the author Christina Gerhardt will be discussing her new book called Sea Change, an Atlas of Islands in a Rising Ocean. And that's a marvelous book with beautiful illustrations, and I will be giving away free copies of that book while supplies last. So you want to arrive early. Lastly, at the end of the month on Sunday the 28th, next Sunday, if you've been wondering how can you get involved in the climate justice movement, come to our workshop at 1 p.m. on that topic. Uh, this workshop led by Cynthia Kaufman addresses how you can get involved starting from wherever you are. The only way forward is together. So if you want to learn more about these programs, you can pick up a flyer on the table over there. There's also a sign-up sheet for the dance company that you'll be um, watching this afternoon. You can also consult our events calendar at our website, sfpl.org, or simply Google SFPL and Everybody's Climate. If you like today's program and wish to comment on it, on it you can take a photo of the uh, QR code that's on the wall. That will take you to an online comment form. That's by the coffee. There's also one by the trash. And one more announcement. I think you've already uh, discovered this, but we are giving away free copies of the book, Dear Human. If you haven't already picked one up, do so uh, before you leave today. And that's all I have to say. I'm going to turn the microphone over to one of the editors of Dear, Dear Human and the host of today's program, Eileen Casanero. Please give a warm welcome to Eileen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, John, for organizing and uh, the library for all their support. Thank you so much to our poets and performers. Uh, my name is Eileen Gassanetto. I'm co-editor of Dear Human at the Edge of Time, a companion to the Fifth National Climate Assessment, and it's a collaborative um, effort by poets and scientists. 
We are honored to be part of Everybody's Climate, a program by San Francisco Public Library, which addresses climate change by connecting all of us in ways that are personally meaningful. And in our case, it's through poetry, dance, and social action. It's my honor to introduce our first reader, Marissa Lin, a poet, policy researcher, and Minnesota native. Marissa has been featured in the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day, and their debut poetry chapbook, Dream Elevator, was published by Kern Punk Press. They were awarded fellowships by the Arts Research Center at UC Berkeley and Kearney Street Workshop, among others. They recently graduated with a master's degree in public policy from UC Berkeley. Welcome, Mar Marissa. Hi, y'all. Can you hear me okay? Is this better? Okay, super. Um, it's really great to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you to Eileen for inviting me and of course putting together this wonderful anthology. Um, thank you to John and the San Francisco Public Library for hosting this. Um, so as Eileen mentioned, I recently graduated from um, my master's program in public policy at UC Berkeley. Um, and so currently feeling this um, season of transition, um, lots of mixed emotions and it's, um, it's an exciting season and it's also a season of um, in some ways grief and isolation, you know, as things are changing. Um, and I think that is also true, you know, when it comes to um, the climate and as things are changing, there's things that are, uh, we are learning to let go, things um, that are new um, and things we just have to readjust to. And so I wrote this poem kind of combining those ideas. Um, and this poem was actually written as I was transitioning into grad school um, and also again feeling that sort of um, grief um, as I was, learning to be in a new season. So this is called, and this is in the anthology, um, page 101, Cosmology of Loneliness. There is a moon. There is a star. There are braids of what ifs roping their orbits around a planet, a bear, Staring up at a cloud, haunches thick against thinning ice. A girl running, eyes socketed to the part of her brain that claims the terrain is unsteady and that she is falling, collapsing like her gut, caving in like endangered silk strands unraveling in a promise evaporated. There is gravity. There are floods. There is a gaggle of nebulae straying too close to a black hole, then a popsicle melting. Mailbox agape. Mouths cursing the sun, minister of wildfires, retaking prairies without apology. There is ash and atmosphere clouded over by the memory of exhausts, of production, of moving once alive acres across oceans to be eaten. Have we lost our names? There is a village that was once a village, a human that was once a home. Now, even asteroids find solace in orphans thrusting themselves into seas, hungry for last things like 
a girl left for another, an animal waiting for dissolution, for who said we were the marrow of everything? Every spring, hearts are broken, a breathing creature disappears, and the earth Heats up by degrees, we leave every bone of ourselves to be parched by winds we have poisoned for profit. Where is the money, they ask. And we point to this dwindling pebble of sky as the galaxy moves on, moves on, she moves on. No thousand vernal moons can keep our skins from drowning these swift, swift blossoms. Thank you. Um, so while I've been fun employed. Um, one of the things that I've been doing is to uh, help raise money for families in Gaza who are escaping the ongoing genocide um, through poem commissions. Um, and so I've had um, some friends and a few strangers request um, poems on any topic um, and the funds that um, uh, we raise from this go directly to mutual aid to help families escape the violence. Um, and so this poem, this next poem um, is one of those poems and it was requested by a friend who recently graduated from her undergrad at UC Berkeley and we had taken the same class um, in the planning school on multi-species cities. So it was sort of about how um, we as planners, um, advocates, public policy people can think of, rethink about cities as places for not just humans to live, but um, the non-human world to also thrive as well. Um, and so that's a little bit of context for this poem. Um, she also mentioned that she was going through a quote, minor self-imposed life crisis after graduating. Um, so this poem is titled, Reflections for a Minor Self-Imposed Life Crisis. To Ivy. There are birds and bees also confused by life. Like that time in class, we sat in a circle talking about animals and cities and municipal codes, regulations that govern the ungovernable for how can an architect maneuver a winged migrant, its vision peppered by beguiling night lights, turbid storms and windows that pretend to be portals? Hardly a noun to explain a skyscraper to a butterfly or a verb clean of manufactured pesticides as waters royal with synthetic skeletons, children picking carcasses off the sideways shore. Can you smell the displacement? We are circling what circles us. By us, I mean animals. By animals, I mean we, because beneath the diplomas, presentations, passing grades, aren't we all hungering for something? Mushrooms, digesting the lint of civilization's bone and chemicals scrubbed by mycelium into the stuff of life. Like that time we walked from campus to downtown BART, our sneakers flecked by eucalyptus and sunset crusting the Berkeley concrete. The way we wondered about the nowadays, the afters, how we asked the crosswalk to decide our futures and even the temporary city graffiti 
Shoe, shadow, biodegradable plastic is sacred, meaning don't measure this life by what lasts. Measure your years by their births. Um, so this next one is a, also a relatively new poem. Um, in my writing practice, I I really like uh, I'm really interested in name poems um, as a means to explore identity, family, ancestry, um, and connection to the land and the earth. Um, and so this is one of those name poems and is inspired by my family's surname, um, Lin, which in Chinese um, means forest or grove of trees. Um, so yeah, this, the title of this poem is Translation. The tree calls to me, and that is enough. Despite my life bound as leaf to gravity, my words cargo thrown overboard. In this shade, I am surrounded, wrapped by wood and wound in the cradle of a hidden ear. The war is near. Even as others say the war has gone, but feel how it leaves its remainders in us. Our chests filled with intended burnings, stockpiled denials that laugh at apocalypse for who says money is enough or whether science will save us. And yet the eucalyptus, with her trickling hair, breathing stop or bruise us forever, arresting some sliver of me while light passes through to another trunk, exploding on a bike, swerving past. And it is evening when I gather what few futures I can calculate, none of which keep the unmeasurable the seed that erupts beneath a chattering meadow, new skin streaked in a pale rainbow, or how I know forests hunger to be seen as much as those named after them, or why my dreams have the calligraphy of saplings, or each day that I rip. I am new. Uh, thank you. I'm going to close with a poem from my chapbook, um, which recently came out in March. Um, and I have a few copies with me if anyone is interested. But um, I, was, I was raised in Minnesota um, on Dakota land. And um, it was a complicated experience, complicated childhood. Um, living in the Midwest as a child of immigrants. Um, yeah, but I think, um, I think the, the earth was a solace for me, even when the people, you know, when the people weren't. Um, and so this is a poem that is set in Minnesota. Um, it's called Hiking with Mother Meadow Trail. In the meadow, we are specks of light. In the light, we become cars of flesh, driving over squirrel bones, organs, unbeating, softening in, into the lint of flowers. Under flowers, dead singing, their swift kin, ours over seas, aloft and apart. In a part, an exile, in exile, a license plate, fleeing from the feet who taught us, recall when we were more heat than light. 
We cut lanes by the dozen, cried holy without knowing it. Effigies of our shadows, we scour the roads for a path to the river, a fallen bridge. Once, I dreamt about bodies of water, their shifting maps, fluid skeletons, how they might lead us back or elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. That was so beautiful. Um, I'd like to uh, read excerpts from my introduction, which would probably explain why I got involved in this work. June, June is low season and monsoon where I grew up, wet with winds and storms and waist-deep floods. Before immigrating, I learned to yield to the archipelagic rhythms and torrents that beset metropolitan Manila, one of the world's original global cities, which linked Asia with the Spanish Americas. I first heard about climate change from my fifth grade social studies teacher who hailed from the same typhoon prone island as my father connecting the dots between landslides and deforestation and garbage pollution and greenhouse gases, she half joked that thanks to human induced weather changes, her tiny hometown nearly 400 miles away from Manila was only a category five tropical cyclone away from being wiped off the map. They say that each of us contains the signature of everything that has ever been all the bright things and the good things and the wretched and very human things. Across the San Francisco Bay Area, more than 5,200 toxic sites are at risk of coming into contact with rising groundwater, which means that everything we've done in the past is coming up to haunt us. In the same vein, poetry is how we move in this world in relation to others. We offer these poems as a way to connect, humanize our diverse stories, and inspire action. Within each poem are ecosystems of shared lives and their histories, burdens, and shared hopes. Um, I'd like to share a poem that I feel will resonate with many people. This poem is by climate scientist uh, Erica Spanger. She says that this was the very first poem she wrote and that um, she was feeling particularly weighed down by the enormity of what she knows was coming when she wrote this. It's on page 135 in case you'd like to read along. On hope, it was the reefs at first. I can see your face, kaleidoscopic dreamscapes of infinitesimal architects a biologic blockbuster that suddenly must end. You said, tell me there's another galaxy with coral. It was the bears too, but you don't say so. Apex beasts in white prowling the eyes at the top of the world are a done deal and somehow cliche, so you spare yourself the mocking of your broken child heart. It was them and the rest and suddenly was everything that makes the world shimmer and always made you know why you came here from dark nothing. You once walked through a world of wounds, but wounds are for healing. You walk now through a world of ghosts, half not yet knowing they are the dead. You felt it grow thin. You started to grieve, to rage, and sometimes to panic looking for the door or the way off this ride. He felt it tear and suddenly it was too late. All those fights, long and frantic, were over and lost. And then you didn't feel it at all. It was gone, sublimated from your soul like vapor from ancient eyes. But listen, it's not that easy to lose hope. In English, we say hope springs eternal. In Russian, its hope dies last. It's the same unbidden pulse. 
In this world, if you love anything, you hope, you move, you press, you keep. You don't even get to decide. You can watch the leaves fall from your hope, a bird here, a town there, a glacier, its river, their people. Sometimes you hear it on the radio, in thick traffic, and you urgently scan the fuming hardscape for something to make sense. Sometimes you know because you wait in season, in place, and it never arrives, arrested en route. And the leaves fall until all hope's branches are beautiful bones before a gathering sky. But don't be fooled. There's more to hope than that. However weak you see it, or dead you think it, or hard you mourn it, this hope thing endures in the dark, where deep roots sense scorched earth. And blind and silent, but with the unrelenting green fused force of life, dig deeper still. However frail you think it, whatever name you call it, hope will not, cannot quit. It relinquishes, shapeshifts, detaches from the object of its desire, and hews only, but so closely, to its driving spark. And therein lies hope's unstoppable power. If you love anything, you hope. Not for this, not for that. That was then. Your hope has since mutated and evolved. He stopped saying, I'm going to have to hope for the best. Now you say, I'm going to have to fight like hell. And that's the bad news. You're going to have to fight like hell without hope of winning. There's no winning anymore when so much is lost. There's only what remains. But look, it's still beautiful. I'll fight for that. Whatever you fought for, whoever's in your locket, the fight is now for what is left. That is all, and that is everything. And you, my weary friend, will never stop. Our next reader is Sharon Coleman, winner of the 2022 Maverick Award for her poetry from the Ruth Weiss Foundation. She sought composition, poetry writing, creative writing, and production and publication at Berkeley City College since 2002, and directs their art and literary journal, Milvia Press. Sorry, Milvia Street. Um, later, Sharon will be joined in an eco-dance performance by Ranko Ogura and Maggie Friedman. Welcome, Sharon. Read my poetry with bare feet. Um, as we do in the dance world, but it's, it's just so good to, to change to bare feet. Such wonderful poetry, everybody. Oh my God, just, I've been sitting here listening and just enjoying all the work, just incredible work. Um, so, is this better for sound? I should get a little closer. Okay. Thank you. Is that? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read from a, um, a long manuscript that I have of, um, um, and I'm focusing on, on drought. So, I've, um, so it's, it's about, it's from a very personal perspective. Um, and I begin with the 1976 drought, which was horrendous here in California. It was, I was 10 years old and I was like, you know, noticing and understanding what drought is. And, um, and I grew up just south of here in San Mateo. Um, and, um, and then, you know, coming back, there's been, you know, for me at 10 years old, I thought that was a one-time thing. <laughs> the drought. Um, and then, you know, it repeats and repeats and repeats. So, um, yeah, so, um, so, but the first three poems are set in my backyard, in my house where I was growing up, and how drought happened for me. 
the year's soil thirsts. The first year soil thirsts, she comes across cool an agapanthus, snails pulled in against heat. When winter simply mists, she follows the snail's radar over rusty nails. Most had been hauled away in buckets. Her father missed some, scanning snails' eyes. Those eyes lead them back to the darkest, tallest leaves. Decades during the war years before, her father planted tomatoes over his foxhole dug deep. When all GI rations came dehydrated. At 13, she sleeps on the floor to toughen herself, to wake from dreams that don't stare back. She draws diagrams, human eyes. What enters upside down travels the nerves. The mind turns it, but what stays splices into fright. Before the old willow tree bows too deeply into the second story, her father saws it, pulls half-cut trunk until it cracks, opens its crumbling core. Pill bugs dream inside, they awaken. In sawdust, the humus they eat and mate. This year, brown grasses mix with sawdust. Her brother's fort under the willow comes down. He builds again where the willow would have fallen. He nails up walls against the slots of his night terrors. She lifts stepping stones where pill bugs have fled, where the soil is darker with nitrogen sewn into clay, now dust. Her father leans his ax. Her brother grips a saw. She invents chemical reactions, balancing them. The snail's glittering mucus are the catalysts. She wakes, needing water, lifts a cup. The bad dream it washes into lines she inks for school. Rain would set off mineral release. Phosphorus, sulfur, hydrogen, energy, a carbon chain backbone, all would resynthesize in soil. The snail's trail, its glue, worm slime, too, recombines life. Dark thought, not her brother's dry night panic, indelible in the deepest, blankest sleep. One or two stories above him, she sketches. An iris, lens, retina, optic nerve, vitreous fluid, the eyeball, and light, and its colors permeate and adhere. Under a lemon tree,
cat eyes twitch below eyelids. She cups its dreaming head. Whiskers. She wakes within its spinning visions. The cat eyes her hand, noses brittle citrus leaves. We've been, this is our second time doing a lot of improv to poetry, so we're very excited about this. Um, so um, in 2022, I was very happy to have um, received the Ruth Weiss um, Award, Maverick Award, <laughs> for all my nonconformity. <laughs> um, and um, I went to um, um, Chile with my husband um, who is doing teaching printmaking. Um, and um, I participated with the printmakers. And we were in, a, in an area in the Andes, or just below the Andes. Um, and, and there again, the, the drought is horrific in the Andes, um, in Peru and in Chile. Um, it's, um, it's, it's really difficult. Um, if, it's not publicized as much in the United States. Um, so this was just one of, of many poems that I, re I wrote from this time. October spring. A net blows across a drought dust hill, across cacti and low trees. The fence cups our ears. A uh, tero tero squeaks at water rushing brown from the Andes. Soil cannot forget what makes us remember. A tree's ghost drinks in light between earth and air. Its leaves fan out green in a single day. Goslings learn to swim in a pond that lasts two days. Where do the waters go? Um, and um, I'm going to do one last poem, and then we're going to dance together. Uh, this is uh, actually, this, this one came from a gas station on Ashby Avenue. Winter drought. Wind clacks through long dry leaves that no rain soaked, no rain brought down, clacking tree by the gas pump. Vapor and dust make the dry tree matter simply. Um, and um, it's been an honor to be part of Ronko Ogura's dance company. Um, and um, 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 this is a dance company that focuses on ecology um, and, um, and practices a specific kind of Bhutto dance. So Bhutto dance is a dance that's originated in Japan in the 1950s. Um, to rediscover, refine, uh, and give value to Japanese creativity and culture during a time of American um, imperialism. Um, and um, and Ranko Ogura specializes in a water body buto, um, which derives from the natural flow of, the, of water within the body. Um, we are literally 70, 80% water, and that water movements informs all of our movements. Um, that's where the movement begins. 
Um, and Ronco has done amazing work um, in the um, in the watershed, um, site specific works um, in the um, by the bay um, to connect the. Um, um, the viability, the health of the oceans, the health of the water to our own health and well-being. Um, and so um, this, um, this piece derives from it. Um, and it also derives from um, the Ainu um, cosmology. The Ainu are um, an indigenous culture um, who've been very persecuted in um, northern Japan in Hokkaido. Um, and having learned so much about their culture, I can see the, the damage that just um, a spiritual system in, in the West where man is at the apex naming everything in most of our, our religious traditions, um, and that even goes down to ecological traditions where you know humans are now the the, direct, the directors of of reclaiming nature but what about living with it every day of your life um, and having a spiritual system that really connects that is about and derives from nature not about um, controlling it, managing it, um, and um, but is a, a worshiping of it. And in Ainu culture, there's, uh, it's, it's all about sustainability. You do not overfish, you insult the gods. You do not overhunt, you insult the gods. Um, um, and um, so really thinking about how um, these kinds of systems that permeate a lot of thought and policy. Um, so um, that's what I'm going to say. So uh, we are, this is an abbreviated version of what we're going to be doing in September. And if you're interested, um, there's a, um, a sign up sheet. You could put your email. We're going to be performing with projections. It's a multimedia event. Um, so I will, we're going to now transform to a stage. <laughs> Thank you.
you, Sharon, um, Ranko, and Maggie. That was so powerful. Our final reader is Kim Shuck, Seventh Poet Laureate of San Francisco and author of 10 books of poems and prose. Kim has various awards and fellowships from an inaugural National Laureate Fellowship and a censorship award from Penn Oakland. Please welcome Kim Shuck. How are you guys doing? You good? Excellent. Okay. I was going to start with a piece that's actually by Mary Norbert Corta. Um, because we all stand on the shoulders of giants with this work. The high roads of hesitation were all part of the path, borders and paving stones and markers, and some to light the many turns. Here at the edge of our journey, we touch anew the strange fences, their hidden gates. We learn the spring with blind fingers, find latches cut close to open, loose and wide beyond. The air will be as sun, gentle with our tears coming into winter, and how shall we account for this pause and entrance into the signal creation? May we raise the hand to bring another tree. It's part of Beginning of Lines by Mary Norbert Corta. Um, my piece in Dear Human. I write much shorter than everybody else who's read, by the way. Uh, it's called Tilting Planet, which may be my only longer than a page poem. Um, watch the lake dry, the gradual crack, the tea of things that were in the water. We are water. These are the birds we've never seen before. Play hide and seek with lightning all the way from San Francisco to someone else's students, the snow. Snow in June and a bloom of crickets on the road. The road was crawling. The world is miracles and maybe doesn't need us anymore. The power lines in Texas, knee deep in new ponds. Are we in a chase? Is this a chase? Do we know where we are running the dry air and the white hilltops? The wind howls more these days and some cry not our fault. And as the water rises, how long will they cry? These are our songs, these rivers. A song for the Colorado, another bone, a bone in the drying places. Uh, this is part of a series called Poppies of August. Meeting a rock at the crossroads, a way of telling time, a way, a pass. Ladybug on the concrete, a perfect drop of blood shaken, an immunity from history. These are the lost balloons, the strings we can't catch. Another rock, a rock, one more bird, interrupted leg or feather or fluff under a wing. What would a breast feather make of this? Making the ticks and ticks, a wristwatch, a timer, a kitchen tick, anti-making tick, the needle tick, the arm tick, tick tick impossible to subvert the mechanism by building a similar mechanism have you pulled the paper into flowers tea and nori a song of cherries and variation of bridge and street food i could eat that poem instead the poem planted dry soil replaced generation and generation the ghost orchard singing along the tracks salt bound fog bound bound the map you're here the surface replaced, the poem singing itself to sleep, waiting, waiting. And I'm going to finish with this from a new book. I hate writing bios these days because there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline. So by the time the bio gets read, it's wrong. I think I've got 13 books now. <laughs> um, under the freeway dough. In the cold tent collects moisture from her breath. The wind rains it back. The, she pulls the gift blanket over her head and waits for dusk. We'll gather chamomile and yerba buena in the places stripped of concrete or blacktop. 
Urban refugee doe, tent in a rainstorm, pulls her person mask into place and heats water for tea. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, one more round of applause for today's poets and dancers. And uh, for the editor of the book, Dear Human, Aline Casanero. And our fabulous AV crew, Mike.